Welcome to the electric heater. How are you doing today? Good. Nice hey, to you. meet you. I've heard a lot of good things about you. Oh, that's great. I, uh, uh, I, I, tend to, I tend to trail and go all over the place. Uh, so we'll start there. Uh, it's always interesting when I meet new people because you can imagine I'm 51 years old. And when I was younger, you know, no one could look anybody up before they meet someone. And it was very important for my father to make sure that I always extended my hand or, uh, you know, uh, how, whatever was acceptable. And that's usually how you had your relation uh, uh, going. And now people can look people up uh, beforehand. And I guess because of what I do and because I, I do a lot of touring and, I'm, and I, we have our own culture at, by this point, 20, 22 years into it, Hmm. everyone knows somebody that knows something I guess by, by, by this, by this time. So anyway, I'm glad that you heard some good things. Uh, that that's always in my favor. That means that, uh, the work I'm doing these days is working. Um, I'm not, I may have not always had those sort of comments, uh, early on in my career when I was <laughs> fight, fighting for the right to be, you know, <clears throat> sure. um, Thank you so much for uh, uh, being on the show. Uh, I've heard, uh, uh, if it's a show, whatever it is, um, I've, I've heard the same about yourself. Uh, but what's interesting, I thought maybe, maybe we could open it up um, uh, that you could give <coughs> uh, the fans, uh, culture, everybody tuning in, whoever, whoever they are, wherever they're from, uh, a little bit about yourself, what you do precisely uh, so they know what they're getting into here, which, yeah. is a normal, which is a normal conversation. We may talk about soccer, you know, I don't know, but uh, gotcha. yeah, at least uh, tell, please tell us what you do. Hey, so my name is Tom Wagner. I'm a scientist at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. And most of my day job right now involves picking the new missions that are going to explore the solar system. And uh, prior to that, I worked for a lot of years studying the Earth's polar regions with satellites and trying to understand particularly how the poles are melting and how sea levels rising. And originally, a long time ago, I studied volcanoes on the Earth and Moon, and I lived overseas in Papua New Guinea for a while, teaching and doing things like that. So I'm really interested in things like climate change and how the Earth is changing and how it's going to affect all of us. But I'm also excited about other worlds. And I got that science fiction element of like, hey, what else is out there in our solar system? So it, yeah, I just, I love, and I always love science, you know, and that was how I got into this in the first place. But I wanted to go outside and see rocks and things like that. Well, one, one thing that's, that's, uh, uh, um, that's so incredibly fascinating um, for lots of reasons. I think at my, at my age now where I'm at, I, I, I tell a lot of people, I'm trying to do the best uh, to plant my feet a little bit more and understand my responsibility as a human uh, onto this planet. I haven't, as you can imagine, touring is for pirates. And when you're in the regiment of piratehood, you know, you just, you set the sails and you go. And I've been doing it for a long time to, yeah. So I haven't really stopped. I've, I've been very fortunate and blessed to be able to look at churches and, you know, I've been to the Louvre and, you know, I've done these things that you think, you know, I do believe they are still things you should do because they are, but I think we all on the planet tend to forget where our feet actually are mm. and just, just how, just how big of a planet it is, but how small of an idea it is. Mm. Uh, compared to, you know, uh, what we see every night. I tell people every day for years, I wake up and I go outside to get, you know, air. And I say to myself, you know, excuse the language, but I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Mm. You know, I just, I look around and I just, it's such an amazing concept. And I'm over the idea of trying to figure out who, what or why. I'm just like, it's happening and I'm part of it, and I may have a big part in it. Uh, so it's fascinating that you look beyond it, and um, 
there's several things we could talk about. I think, I think probably one thing we could probably do that'd be good for everybody is talk a little bit about your interest that you said, um, uh, you know, these, these horrible, frightening subjects that uh, I would mm. say the common person. And when I say the common person is I spend most of my day working on music, family, mm. these sorts of things. So I'm only hearing about the polar ice caps or the ozone layer, you know, or things like this briefly and not every day, you know? Mm. So um, tell us a little bit about that. What can you tell us uh, where, where we're at? I know it's, it's gonna be frightening and, but you know what, knowledge is something you have to give. And if I have a responsibility, I think we all should hear where we are maybe compared to where we were or where we're going to be like what's going on mm. so you know just to start with so that a lot of my career was spent going to antarctica going to the arctic and studying them by satellite studying them by airplanes trying to figure out what kind of change is going on there because they're changing faster than anywhere else on the planet like we talk about a little bit of warming happening right around us but there's a lot more warming happening there and so things like the ice is melting like there's an ocean on the top of the planet called the Arctic Ocean. And that ocean is usually covered with ice. You can think about that ice like a mirrored hat on the top of the planet. And as you take that mirrored hat off, well, now the sunlight that comes down hits the dark hair and it warms up the ocean and that kind of compounds warming. What does that mean? Well, well, here's what that means. It means things like our weather patterns are changing in North America. It means Arctic peoples, people that live right on the coastal zones of the Arctic, their lives are being changed dramatically as the ice goes away. Their coastlines are eroding and literally their houses are falling into the ocean. Um, and then you got a place like Greenland or like Antarctica where you have miles of ice up on land. And what's happening is that ice is either melting or the glaciers, and it's hard to picture, right? But you can almost picture like if you took a big thing of honey and poured it on the table in front of you, like how a pile would build up in the middle and then it would flow out to the sides. Well, that's how the ice works in Greenland and Antarctica. And so that ice is speeding up as it flows into the ocean. Long story short, that's why we're seeing sea levels rise around the world. And like places like Florida, places like Brooklyn, New York are seeing increased flooding. And when a storm happens, now um, you get further run up. Here's the thing though, does all this stuff make me hopeless? No, I mean, I, I actually firmly believe that there's kind of two approaches to this, you know? And the one is this, right? The planet's already a little different now than when you and I were kids. And it's there's a certain amount of change that's locked in, right? Sea level's gonna rise, temperature's gonna rise. Other weird things are gonna happen. Like there's gonna be more rainfall in the Northeast and it's gonna be drier in the Southwest. But, and we have to actually prepare for that change. Like we gotta put it into all of our planning. But then there's that longer term change. And that's where us putting less CO2 into the atmosphere, that's where we can have a big impact. And so it's like, we have like a near term thing for us to say, whoa, these changes are happening and they're going to continue, but we can work on the future together. Are we working on the future together? So we're seeing it in different ways. And, and one, one reason I love talking to young people, you know, is I think back to like when I was in the 70s and I was in school, right? And there were those little things like give a hoot, don't pollute, Woodsy the owl. And then also there was this stuff like, the concept of ecology, right? Like I can vividly remember, I had this book when I was a kid and it had like a picture of a duck with oil on it and the big words ecology. And it was like the first time we started to really understand the earth as a system where everything is interconnected. You know, now we take all that for granted, right? But kind of point being, a lot of us that grew up in the 70s and 80s, we don't think about, we don't think it's right to pollute. We don't think about throwing trash outside, all those things. And I think that the younger generation now, they're learning about climate change from the get-go and they're understanding it. And I think they're going to be a part of that long-term change. I think right now, look, it's become a little bit like religion. People are getting pretty well locked into their thinking. Um, and I understand that. You know, it, it's hard for some people for all kinds of reasons. I mean, there's people who actually study how people get into that fixed mindset. But the point being, I'm really hopeful for the long haul because I think we're starting to make the changes. Well, that's that. That's good to hear you say that you think that we are starting to make the change. 
changes, you know, that that's hope. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, it may, for someone like me, it's bizarre because I'm already in a movie, you know, I feel like my whole life is a movie. And then, you know, and I could go into that, you know, and everyone involved with me, we have certain ways of explaining that. And I, I'm sure all of us in the world feel like we're in our own movie. It's not something, you know, I came up with, but you know, it's like, here I am 51 and like, I'm really seeing, you know, I'm noticing by watching the news, which I wouldn't give two minutes to when I was 18, you know, but <clears throat> I want to know that the people who are being drastically, um, you know, a crazy flood or something, I want to know they're okay. Um, I, I have fans, but more than just fans, they're m our culture which means they're my family, my friends. I have friends in places that have these drastic things happen. I want to know they're okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more familiar with things happening than I ever have been. Mm. So it's nice to hear, it's nice to hear um, that the younger generation it has it from the get-go. Uh, there, there was something I watched a couple of years back. It was some gentleman who's, big time and you know I'm bad with names but he was saying that if you don't know how to code if you don't learn how to code you're not going to be able to express yourself in the future and I thought whoa that's heavy you know but but that made me sort of hopeless I was like man we're going into like Logan's run or or some crazy stuff but it's really nice to hear like someone like yourself say like the younger generation it's like built in like our system we're, we're teaching that and like we got to do something about this so that's nice because I, for a while i've been feeling is everyone going to go in and and just ignore out and let out go to hell and stay in and it's all those really weird science fiction movies that we see that you know that we like and it's that you know, earth, the dead earth, and it, but it's still earth, you know, um, so it's cool to hear that maybe the younger generation has a built in, I think they need to hear that. And it is nice to, to be able to rely on new ideas, fresh ideas, um, that can just maybe you're saying less uh, uh, CO2. What were you saying? Less what? Yeah. So the big one is this, right? Carbon dioxide. When we burn gas in our cars, when we burn coal to generate electricity at a power plant to power our homes, all of that carbon dioxide, which had been locked up in the ground, when we burn, we put it up into the atmosphere. And that causes the atmosphere to work more like a blanket. So when sunlight comes in, that energy gets trapped. And that's, it's, it's very, very straightforward. It works kind of like a greenhouse, right? Like you can have a, you know, you can have these glassy houses that trap sunlight, keep it warmer inside. And that's kind of what's going on. The, um, and there is stuff to be scared about, right? But I don't think the response should be to be like frightened. Like, look, when I was a kid, when you were a kid, we were all gonna die in nuclear war, right? You, you wanna know the one I was most afraid of? I really thought the killer bees were going to come get us, you know, like, and we had all these great disasters. I remember, I remember I got this. You said Woodsy the Owl. And for a moment, I, I just for a brief moment yeah. while you were talking, I, I literally was transformed into a whole other world of myself. I was like, Woodsy the Owl came to my school. Right. There you go. <laughs> so the killer bees go on. But yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, and here's. I'm not, I do not mean to diminish the impact of climate change. And we could go on about like, like a, it's going to, it's going to change things in all kinds of ways. Like let's take coffee, right? I was talking to a guy from the World Bank recently, and they're interested in how the economies of developing countries are going to change. Take like a country like Colombia, where they grow coffee. As the planet gets warmer, coffee trees need a certain cold um, for them to continue to flower. So as you warm up, the areas where you can grow coffee start to change. They get smaller in some areas, but maybe you know, some areas you can grow coffee because it's a little warmer. But the problem is this, right? And this is where it gets complicated. And this is what like this thing called the IPCC report that you might hear about, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Every couple of years, they come out with a report where they say, hey, we got to stop everything now because if we warm up a degree and a half, it's game over for the planet. 
what they're saying is that human systems, so let's take the people that grow coffee in Colombia. If all of a sudden they can't grow coffee anymore, what happens? Like, do they have to move to a new location? If you raise sea levels on the East Coast of the US or in the Nile Delta in Egypt where millions of people live, where do those people go? And when you look at examples like Syria, right? Where a whole bunch of people were displaced out of the country you create these tragic stories of you know, people crossing the ocean and dying, influxes of migrants into other countries that may not want them. Um, and so that's the kind of upheaval, right? That people really worry about. Um, some parts of the world become better places to live. Canada gets warmer, right? Things like that. But what we're talking about are these big shifts, right? Now, personally, I think we're gonna adapt. Right, there's going to be impacts. Some people, their houses are going to flood. Insurance rates are going to go up. Those kinds of things. Um, but uh, you know, I think that we will. But it's going to be. We have to expect that there's going to be a lot of change in our world. But I'll tell you the other thing too. When you made the point about coding, and I've heard other people say that too. Like if you can't code, you can't get a job in the future. Coding is important, and coding is a powerful tool. But it's not the only way to generate ideas and implement ideas. I mean, like, look, you're an artist, right? What is your thing? You implement your ideas in all kinds of ways, from it writing a song to organizing a tour and a concert, right? That's what people do who are successful in, in any field, right? Be it Elon Musk, but and like in climate change, there's loads of people coming up with new ideas, and they're not related to coding, right? They're related to being creative. One I was reading about the other day was, could we take CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it into concrete? Because we're making a lot of concrete around the world, right? Um, there are a whole bunch of ways that people are, you know, coming up with for us to deal with climate change that make me happy <laughs> and make me think we got a chance. I'm a little worried. I got kids. I'm worried about my kids' near future. Um, but yeah, the coding one always freaks me out too, because I'm like, hey, there's plenty of room for the poets, the artists, the people that like to build stuff. And look, I work in science. I got news for you. We have all different kinds of people in science that come up with great ideas. It's not just the people that can code. And that, that's really cool. And you're right. Um, the human thought process is such a wonderful thing. I studied uh, the concept of pi uh, for, for a long time. And one thing, one thing I read about pi that just blew me away was that uh, in, short, uh, in short, it was something like if you if you try to figure out pi, you will take a course of action against yourself. And the answer is because you're trying to figure out something that cannot be figured out. Mm. So generally, I guess we move to the concept of going mad mm. uh, or whatever. But beyond of whatever that explanation is, there's the word you, then you, and then yourself. So mm. I'm like, always, who are we? So I believe in us. I believe in us as a human race. I believe we will always make it through, but I believe we're the problem. And there's no way not to prove that the human race is the problem. And I want to ask you a very obscure question. People aren't going to like this. But while you were speaking, you know, when we use words like insurance, but we can, we, we can, we can adhere it to a family's home mm. moving into water mm. and then insurance rates, we use the word, you know, livelihood disappearing, but then in, we use a word like insurance. So when you said that, I went immediately to the dinosaurs. Mm. And I was just like, you know, can you imagine like being around those things and like just what they were, they were never going to put the bad stuff in the air to begin with. They were never going to have to bring up Johnny's house going in the water and insurance is going to go up. But what they worried about was natural events that happened and it just took them out. Mm. And, and it's like, we're taking ourselves out. Mm. You know, and it's such an insult, such a, it's so, it seems like such, why do we, why, what is it that you and I can do? And what is it? What is the absolute fact, the number one fact that should be implemented like a law 
that won't make anyone angry because it's just something that everyone should do, like getting up and going mm. to the bathroom. Everyone mm. needs to get up and go to the bathroom sooner or later. You mm. just do it. We agree. You should do it. We give you places yeah. to do it. So what, why are we the problem? What's the one thing everybody could do every day to make yours and my kids not have a bleak future? <clears throat> you know, you hit the nail right on the head with the going to the bathroom thing. And there's some people, especially there's a, there's a great book called Earth, the Operator's Manual by this guy, Richard Alley of Penn State, a professor, wonderful guy. Actually, he plays guitar and sings too. He sings these really funky earth science songs. I'll check it out. But one of the things that Richard pointed out was that, look, back in the day, we didn't have sewage systems. People poured poop into the streets, you know, and that you even read books about like the early 20th century, late 1800s. They talk about how it would dry out and create this awful dust. People would get sick. They would get cholera. It would contaminate water supplies. And you know what? Humanity solved that problem. And here's the thing. It was basically a tax. Like it cost us about, let's say, 30% of the amount of money and energy that we had went into building, building sewer systems and things like that to deal with that problem. And so the same thing with CO2, right? Like, look, we got to shift our economy. Not easy to do. Economies are complex. Human systems are complex. But we actually have the tools to do it, and the cost is about 30%. Right? Like that's what it means. Every time you go to fill up your gas tank, every time you flip on a light, it's going to cost 30% more. And that might be the kind of thinking, the one thing that's got to change is we got to accept there's going to be a big hit like that. Now, politicians, everybody else, it's hard to do that, right? Like people have talked about, you could just implement a carbon tax, right? Um, the other way to go is that, and they don't want to do that. You're not willing to increase taxes. Other people go, well, maybe the solutions will come from entrepreneurs and visionaries and inventors, and they'll come up with new tools that make it easier so we don't have to pay the tax quite so easily. So you have these things like, again, storing CO2 in concrete, capturing CO2 at power plants and putting it underground, transitioning to electric cars, wind power, solar power, tidal power. Um, you know, there's so much sunlight that comes into the earth. It's like at the equator, it's like a thousand watts over like, you know, nine square feet. I mean, there's plenty of energy coming into the earth. Um, and there's also some ideas. There's actually a new study out from the National Academy of Sciences. Could we find a way to reflect more sunlight back into space? Are there tools we could bring to bear if we can't solve all the problems? Cover, cover, cover the earth with aluminum foil, basically, is what you're saying and bounce it back. Yeah, or put things up in outer space. Now, you know, all these things are hard to do, but here's the thing. Um, and if you go and you just look, the expansion, the growth in the number of people, it's destroyed habitat, it's put plastics in the ocean, and it is hard to grapple with, you know? I'm reading a book right now called The American Serengeti that's about the amazing animals that lived in North America before even the Native Americans got here all kinds of things like you know we think of the bison today there was a bison that was twice the size of that there were giant sloths that were 20 feet tall horses started out in north america and all these things went extinct um but you know we're also recognizing that this is important even in places like china you know there is hit by climate change as much as anybody else and they're while they're building coal fire power plants they're also really worried about the impacts and they're trying to do things so Collectively, I just feel like we're not a critical mass yet, but we're getting there. And I think human ingenuity and spirit's gonna win out. Well, I feel hearing that, I feel like I feel like I need to be there in the Senate or somewhere with two sides. You know, and when 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 we're speaking about global death for hu humanity. There's really no talk about like, you know, we'll, we'll just tax more or we'll just turn it down one notch. It's like two signs. Give me your idea. I turn one sign. It says equals death, period. You're a capitalist. Mm. You want money equals death. The other one is a, a positive one. It says possibility. Let's reconvene and work that one out. Mm. There's only really two answers to all this old generation 
I don't, I've never considered money part of the earth. I, I'm not interested. None of it, none, none of it's real. None of what, none of what we've thought, you know, getting somewhere faster or, you know, speaking like we are. I mean, you know, you, you may or may not have children. They may or may not have schoolwork or a soccer game, you know, but we're talking, um, there, there's way more important things than to worry about how we've made our world. That's what mm. I'm hearing. And, you know, I just, I try not to, I try not to talk about anything unless it's factual, you know, because it gets confusing, but, uh, you know, it's scary hearing people like yourself saying, you know, we're not at critical mass yet, but that's the problem. You know, you are concerned about it, but the people that hear someone like yourself say, we're not at critical mass. They're just going to go eat a bologna sandwich and put it off. It's just that you, I believe you probably work for the government. And if I come to soft spots, they're probably just nailing me and you off. They're like, burp. And just <laughs> that is true. I work for the government. It's, but yeah, don't worry. It's not an efficient government talk, so I can speak freely. It, it, it happens to me quite a bit. In fact, I have an on, I have a very weird energy. And you might be able to, you might be the one person to help me. I've always said that NASA, somewhere within NASA's buildings, could be down in Florida. I don't know. But there's a room where someone like yourself is going to go step in, and I'm going to step in and just step out. And I believe I just have a lot of uh, electricity. I think that's the problem. A lot of iron, yeah. iron or minerals that equal. So, you know, we do have rooms like that. You would get a kick out of this, too. So there are rooms where you do those kind of isolation rooms where you can put someone in and just see the magnetic fields that they're generating. Because wow. sometimes on, like, spacecraft, one of the things we do is try to measure the magnetic fields around planets. And what you have to do is isolate every part within the spacecraft itself to be... You know, because you've got power systems, so you want to make sure they're not biasing your instruments. Like it would be like hum in a guitar or something like that. What's causing it? Where did it come from? But you know, the other stuff you would like. We have this room. I always call it the screamer. And you go in, and there's this giant horn speaker. And what it is is it just it's a giant room. You can wheel a whole spaceship in there, and then you blast it with as much sonic power as you can to make sure nothing breaks or gets loose or anything like that. Oh my God. I mean, that's, that's, what I grew up going to Cape Canaveral uh, and stuff when I was growing up and I, oh, watched, cool. I got to watch a couple shuttles go up. Obviously in school, they used to stop class uh, so we could watch that stuff. Uh, unfortunately, I remember the one that, you know, unfortunately uh, blew up. I remember, I remember teachers running around deciding what we were going to do, all of mm. us outside for recess. Yeah. It just took our brains right off of it. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, fascinating space and uh, planets. So, yes, I've always said that NASA's got a room that might explain uh, my artistic schizophrenia or my energy source or the voices or the unbreakableness of myself or whatever. Let me ask you this. Um, I don't subscribe to conspiracy uh, but while I'm working on art, uh, mainly photo art or uh, moving pictures, I might have a DIY in the background or I'll have some conspiracy. Um, I've always been fascinated with the thought of this idea of Middle Earth simply because I haven't spent a lot of time of my life uh, being educated what is underneath the first mm. five foot the first 10 foot where does it go from there is mm. there really lava in the middle and like what you know i just i'm not educated yeah, so yeah. i i stumbled across some interesting stuff pilots um and you know if you go on google maps and you look at antarctica or the north pole you know there's a giant block out you're not allowed to see a certain area there's a lot of talk about there being, you know, the reflection, the, the atmosphere down there has sunlight because of the reflection, the northern lights, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. They say that's where the unicorns and the giants live. Yeah. And, and, you know, all the stuff that used to be myth, we could go into some things that used to be considered myth, like the silverback gorilla was considered a myth. Right. 
but then all of a sudden, boom, no longer a myth. Uh, the um, um, the giant lizard, the uh, um, uh, the Komodo, Komodo dragon, dragon. Yeah. that was a myth. That was a myth. It's written that there was a dragon that had poisonous saliva, right. and that was a myth, no longer a myth. So anyway, if you go to go Google Earth or whatever it is, there's a giant block out. There's even pilots who have said they've flown down in it, you know, under oath, flown United States planes down into this area. Uh, obviously, the Germans were studying Antarctica. Uh -huh. Uh, the snow's been melting. Things have been showing. We've been finding, we've been finding boats. Uh, some old theories have been put to rest because boats have been found where we know what happened. Uh, tell me, Middle Earth, uh, a hole up in the North Pole. You know, you can only say what you can say. I don't buy into conspiracy, but I think it's interesting that we're not allowed. That at one point we were allowed to look. And we are no, allowed, no longer allowed to look uh, for whatever reason. And we also know, as uh, the common folk that I call myself, we also know that everybody resides there for education, military, everyone's there. There's a lot that goes on in such an isolated place mm. where none of us can get to. Mm. And now none of us can see. I mean... Is Antarctica a hot spot? I mean, what, what's going on besides the education? Middle Earth, a hole in the All earth. Right. What can you tell me and what can you not? Yeah, so the I've been very lucky in that I've been to Antarctica a lot of times and spent many months there. And you said uh, I've, that. Yeah. yeah, I've flown by plane and I've been lucky enough to go across the Drake Passage by ship also, which was really crazy. Okay, one of this is... One of the reasons is not some, and I've been to the South Pole, the area that you can't see sometimes in something like Google Earth. Here's the problem. Most of our satellites that fly over the Earth and map it, they don't go right over the pole because people aren't that interested in the poles. And if you go straight over the poles, you don't get as much time over the other parts of the planet where people live. But the fact is, there are some images and you can see loads of them from airplanes and other things. But here's what I would tell you especially with Antarctica, but also with most of the world, truth is always stranger than fiction, okay? And so one of the neat things is when you fly to the South Pole, you know, you get off and there's this whole station there. And the original station that they built in the 1950s for the International Pole Year, the International Geophysical Year, when you read the, read the books and you read about what these people went through, you know, they built, they dug this station into the ice, right? And they lived there. And because the ice is always moving, that whole station has been crushed up and you can't go in it anymore. And then in the 70s, they built this weird geodesic dome that you can see pictures of it. The Seabees built, that was amazing. I got lucky, I got to spend a night in it before they dismantled it. Um, and now we have this big giant station that'll hold like 200 people. But it's a great place. There's telescopes that are looking up into deep space. There's actually a really weird telescope where they drilled holes in the ice that go down like a half a mile and they put down little light detectors. And the reason they do it is we're looking for neutrinos, these subatomic particles. In the two seconds that you and I have been talking, 300 million neutrinos just blasted through your nose. They're really, really hard to observe. But sometimes when they go through the ice in Antarctica, they hit a water molecule and make light that we see. And these neutrinos, come from sources outside our solar system, outside our galaxy. And we don't really know where they're coming from. We're working on trying to figure that out. Also, there's just weird stuff overall at the pole. Underneath the pole, the South Pole Station that's there now, they built these tunnels. And there's a fun um, Werner Herzog movie called, I think it's called Adventures at the End of the Earth. You can walk down in these tunnels and it's so cold. It's like minus 60 in the tunnels. Like your eyelashes freeze together as you're walking around. The workers who built this place did all kinds of weird things. And so literally some guy's taking me on a tour of the tunnel and I look over and there's a fish. <laughs> and they had dug into the side of this ice tunnel, this alcove, and they put this fish in there. And it's like, this is, they put a little plaque and everything else, but it's so cold that fish is never gonna rot. It's gonna be there forever. Um, but here's the thing, that's just the stuff people made. In terms of other stuff, there are volcanoes that are still active that are under the ice. 
There are lakes under the ice that are mild thick that have been cut off from the surface of the earth for 12 million years. There are these animals like, you know, penguins when you meet them in real life are even more wild and crazy and unbelievable than when you see them on TV. I mean, like emperor penguins that can dive down so deep and for so long. The whole bottom of the ocean around Antarctica is actually teeming with life, but it's life that doesn't make shells. So it's these giant worms and all these, these slimy things. But, you know, like it's, it's just everything about Antarctica. Is, there are landscapes that I've walked on where there has been no rain or erosion in like 10, 12 million years. It's the closest thing we think we have to Mars. And like a single snowflake will fall on a rock and melt. And that will cause the beginning of a tiny hole and then eventually a little grain of sand will get in there and spin like a ball bearing and carve out these weird long two. It's just crazy. Every The real stuff is just even, there's moss. Somebody found freeze dried moss in Antarctica that they revived after it was millions of years old. Like it'd been sitting there. It's like, so like, that's why I say, what's one of the exciting things about science um, is that it, the closer you get to it, the even weirder that it becomes, right? Like, yeah, you, know, you were talking about Middle Earth, Middle Earth. And I love those kinds of stories. When I was a kid, In Search of was my favorite show. I love stories of the Bermuda Triangle, Bigfoot. I mean, it's one of the reasons I got into science, right, was those kinds of things. In South America now, with satellites from space, we've actually mapped out all these ancient temples and roadways that were lost to the jungles over time, right? Mapping the seafloor around the world, we've seen all kinds of crazy things from old shipwrecks to cities. I mean, it's, it's really, and then as the, like the way that the earth itself works, you know, you look at a place like the Baikal Rift in Russia, right? Where it's this giant lake that's got, I think it's got like a fifth of the world's fresh water. And it's so clear, if you drop a coin, you can see it a hundred feet down. The way this lake is forming is the surface of the earth is literally ripping itself apart and opening up and getting filled in with water. Like, um, yeah, there's just, there's so many fascinating, amazing, real things that like, it's not that, you know, the other stories are fun, but it's like, you learn the real stuff and you're like, like we just had this visitor from another star come through our solar system. Oumuamua, it's named. A couple of years ago, some astronomers were looking up and they saw this thing coming in that came close to our sun. And this is a real story. And then it rocketed out of our solar system faster than it came in. And nobody knew what it was. First, they published these pictures that looked like this cigar thing. And then last week at the big meeting of the people that study this stuff, hey, we actually think it was more of a disk. Somebody wrote a book where they said this was definitely an alien spaceship, a respected astronomer. Some of the other people who have made their career about searching for extraterrestrial life, they got mad because they were like, look, we don't think this was a spaceship. We think it was a piece of a planet like Pluto. And that what happened was when it got near the sun, it got heated up. And the ice that's on it is actually made of nitrogen. And that nitrogen just melted and turned to a gas so fast. It was like a rocket engine that took this thing out of here. So like I say, a related well, one, Pluto, right? What was it though? What was it? A chunk we think of ice like Pluto that like, came but, through. I see. So what you just explained is what we think it was. Yeah, we that's I've the best that. guess. I've seen that. And that's frightening when you see stuff like that, you know. Uh when that one was pretty severe, the the way it takes off. Uh, <laughs> when it comes in, it just goes out. Yeah. Um, but you know. Other Go worlds, ahead. right? Like Pluto, you know, everybody gets upset because Pluto is demoted as a planet. They, you know, and what's funny is we joke about this at NASA headquarters. The head of NASA even sent out a tweet that was like, I still think of Pluto as a planet, but we can talk about that. But here's the thing. One of the reasons that we don't talk about Pluto as a planet anymore is because it turns out there's over 2000 things out there like Pluto. Some of them have rings. Some of them are binary bodies rotating around each other. There's just all kinds of wild, exciting stuff out there. Wow. With, with you bringing up the roadways, <clears throat> uh, uh, being able to see the ancient trails and stuff like that, you know, I, I know I bought a fish finder a couple of years ago and you could see the fish under logs. And it was wow. like, it was, it was just like, 
you know, blew my mind. It kind of took away some of what, you know, I learned to do my whole life. Uh, but it was amazing that you could have that information. Um, I remember when the Bermuda Triangle was sort of filmed like that as well, where they could start explaining how three tides come and, you know, they could get to more answers around weather rather than, you know, mm. weird stuff happening. But <clears throat> I'm going to ask you this one because I have a feeling you're just going to tell me the truth. I, I just have a feeling you know, and you can tell me. And I'm, I'm betting on this one fully, have been. I'm from this world of this thought. But Sasquatch, to me, is 190%. I don't give a, 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 I don't give a damn what anyone says. Um, it starts with me from, it starts with, from me, from all the native beautiful tribes of North America. Every single one of them has a story to tell, whether it's the man of the woods or this or that, or every one of them has a story. And we all know the integrity I feel of the earth and um, especially how they uh, uh, how they present themselves with the earth. So, yes or no, Sasquatch? Yes or no? All right. I need Please to do. preface my answer, which is when I was a kid, I That's read yes. every That's every yes. Bigfoot Loch Ness monster in the library. I still read every Bigfoot story that I can. No. And it suppresses me to say that. And here's the only reason I say no. And um, because it's very likely that if there was something like Sasquatch out there, not only would we, maybe we might not find a living Bigfoot themselves because they hide a lot, but we would find bones, poop, hair, DNA. Well, we have... We have the hair. We definitely have the hair. That's true. That much I believe. And that comes from the Indian reservation. That comes from them honestly not looking like if you look at, you know, I'm just saying you go deep. <clears throat> it's the way they speak about it. They're never mm. speaking to Monster Quest. They're never looking for money. The way they speak, they're like, you know, this older Sasquatch, they have the name. They're like, he comes a lot for the mulberries. We keep collecting this hair. He's older, we think. Mm. Um, but my, okay, you say no, but here's my deal. Mount St. Helens. Mm. Mount St. Helens. Um, there's lots of information out there about the collection of all living things that were collected for disease purposes and other reasons that were collected after the ash, after people could get up there. So for example, the military was called in to get the moose or the black bear mm. or the Sasquatch. And there are, you know, Sasquatch is either real or it's not. It's either true or it's not. This guy, this guy who was said it was his job to get the baby Sasquatches and put them in this pile, and they weren't allowed to talk about it, and it went away in this helicopter. You know, that's true or it's not. Uh, it's depressing you say no, because if you have been to the South Pole and been where moss used to grow, but was cold for 10 million years and brought back by a human, I guess, I guess you'd be pretty honest, or, or, it's your duty and lawful NDA with the beautiful government and such a lovely answer. <laughs> so let me turn this out at you though. I'm just having fun. I'm just no, having no, no, I totally get it. But here's what I would say to you, especially as an artist, right? Just something to think about. And I have friends who are um, sociologists and anthropologists. And, and you brought this up earlier on with ways of thinking, right? And I'm fascinated by how people think fundamentally differently about things and their worldview and how it's all integrated. And, and I lived in Papua New Guinea for a long time. You know, I had a lot of people who lived, I had a lot of friends who lived lives in the village, traditional lifestyles and things. And 
one of my friends who worked a lot with native Alaskan peoples, one of the things she said was that when you have a mythos like that, like Bigfoot or other, it's not just Bigfoot, right? There's loads of mystical creatures and gods. And look, we have a lot of those things in Western culture too, right? That people believe in that are more mystical. Um, but when you have something that's, you know, mystical, but also supposed to be very tangible, like around you right there, like in New Guinea, it was spirit snakes and things, right? That changes your thinking, right? If you think that there is these things around that you can interact with, right? It fundamentally changes the way you interact with the land, how you think about the ocean, how you think about your food, how you treat other people, how you think about systems of justice. And so here's the thing, there's probably not Sasquatch, right? But there's a lot to be learned and a lot of fascinating things to think about with the people that do believe in them or they have some other connection to the land or the way that they think about the universe that's just interesting, you know, and just fun to learn about and fun to interact with. And, um, you know, sometimes when we deconstruct everything, you know, in the way, well, there's no DNA, yes or no question, we lose all that, right? And science isn't just about removing all of, to me, it's not just about stripping everything away and making it no fun. You know, um, sometimes what I would say is that, you know, science changes, like, I personally love magic. I really like to see like just hand magic. I love the ideas that people can make a card appear, disappear. And I just, I like being fooled. I enjoy watching it, you know? Turns out what scientists are now doing is realizing that magicians are tapping into certain things in our nervous system. That, that's how they trick us. Like we're programmed to look a certain way, act a certain way, think a certain thing. And they are working with that. They have discovered those things that we might not have even discovered otherwise, right? So to me, I think it's all a big integrated fun system and we should enjoy it. it. What's interesting, what's interesting that you can watch back, you only called it Bigfoot for the whole conversation, which is a coined name. And then when we got into it, you called it Sasquatch. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I believe that word's been in you for a long time because the coined word, uh, is is when you just said when you just said um, when we go deep into something we lose that see Bigfoot is what makes us lose it because that's yeah. a coined phrase by an article in a paper that's what makes it fake but Sasquatch is right the, you know and you know so I agree with you it's fun it's fun to think about things it's fun to be fooled you know why isn't it you know why why wouldn't you want to be fooled as long as it's not cruel you know and right. uh uh yeah that's fascinating and the fact um i've said uh i wear a clown mask and uh my therapist i say this a lot and uh we'll just see if the whole world picks up on it or not i don't know i don't even know if i know what it means it could be me it could not be me but my therapist says when i wear my clown mask that's the only time i'm telling the truth huh so there's an actual phobia of clowns, okay? Um, right. the, the, I've always felt like the number one phobia is arachnophobia. And, I, and, and the way you can explain that is if you're on the Baltic Sea in a ship, you're more scared of spiders than you are of the Baltic Sea. That's the number <laughs> one phobia in the right. world. You're surrounded by water, but you're, there's a spider in your bunk and you, right. you flip out, okay? Um, but there's a clown phobia and I've always told people, they, I've, I've literally seen in my lifetime of being a performer, musician, um, we could go into it for a long time, but I have, a, I, I have a certain way about me that people would say, and you could, you know, look me up and see it. And I just have a way that clown is. But when I have, when I have encountered those people that actually have that phobia for real i mean it it's frightening because it's so real you know you it, it's like someone falling in a seizure you don't want them to get hurt and when i've been around people that are literally motionless because of the fear of me uh. <laughs> but the thing is is i take advantage of it with love i take advantage of it i i immediately move into slow motion and I make my way to them 
in a loving way. It's not loving to them, but uh, they're, they're, they're froze. But what I want to tell you is people ask me like what, you know, they, they might use a word like power. What gives you that power? I'm like, mm. it's not power. It's not power. To me, it's oversaturation. I have the gift to oversaturate. I can be all of everything right now or nothing at all at the same time existing at zero, right? Mm. So it's like, I can bring all the color or none of the color all at once. I can bring every dance or no dance. I can overly talk or not talk. And when you add that to a clown that knows mm. he's a clown, you see these people disappear and I, I'm only talking about because you're talking about magicians. Mm -hmm. um, I've always thought, my friends and I have always thought there was two sorts of people, magicians and mystics. Mystics walk through the raindrops and, and you know, they get to do, you know, the, the sort of funner things and magicians sort of make things happen. Um, and uh, uh, so that's interesting that scientists literally look into the ability of the human energy of tapping in you know we hear about that the long the more we tap into our brain maybe we can speak to each other maybe we can self-heal um, maybe we can alter things the more we learn it's all very fascinating um so besides all that what 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 do you like to do um before we get off um what are what are some of your hobbies because it sounds I mean, first of all, I got to get my brain on the fact that you've been invited to uh, uh, a seas that are under things that are opening up and leaking into the middle of the earth. Like, I mean, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. That's going to keep me up at night. I mean, forget Sasquatch for a minute. You've been where sand is creating. I mean, what are we talking about here? The world is a beautiful place. Everyone watching needs to learn. If you would like the opportunity to see that moss and have it still be there, we all have a part to do something mm. uh, that's factual. Uh, one, one cigarette butt thrown out, it's not a, it is a problem, but it's not a big problem. 10,000 out the window is a serious problem. Mm. So anyway, besides all that wonderful stuff that you shared with me today, very fascinating. I would love to meet you in person sometime. And I, I would love to be uh, invited, if you will. I'm kind of shoving myself in here, but it would be awesome to see a couple of these weird rooms that uh, civilians could, could see or partake in because that's fascinating to me that we study ourselves. And I've always wanted to do an isolation tank, but I thought I'd flip out. I already, <laughs> I already contemplate uh, nothingness too much. Yeah, it, it takes me to my own death, and gotcha. then and then I'm there in my own death, and then somehow I'm not here, and I'm further, and I think I'm believing, and it's too it's too overwhelming. So I thought if I get in an isolation tank, I really believe I may disappear in a dream or something, you know. And it's a scary thought, but I love that we do that that stuff. So maybe we can get together sometime, do the electric theater. But before we go, um, yeah you as a human being um you said you love you love magic but um you know not to like pry into your personal life or whatever but uh i mean what what do you like do you like to throw darts uh do you fancy bourbon uh do you do you hike what, what do you like to do man besides all that you know, wonderful stuff you're doing for all of us thank you by the way oh thank you you know the kind of fun thing is my favorite thing is fixing things <laughs> Like, I just really enjoy, like, how things work. And it could be anything from my friend's dishwasher to home repair to a boat motor. You know, like, like if you came to my house, like, my basement is filled with tools and all kinds of weird devices. And my kids will build computers together and stuff like that. Um, and I, you know, think for me, it traces back to when I was really young and working on bicycles. And uh, I just, my dad had this toolbox of wrenches and I was like, just like my earliest memories was like, wow, you could turn these screws and change this thing and raise the seat. And it, and it kind of gets to, you know what I try to, one thing I think for kids today, 
we put so much pressure on them to like worry about their future. You know, like if you're playing baseball, it's like, well, if you want to go to the majors, you got to do this. Or, you know, you got to learn to code. We talked about, right? Or you can't just pick up the guitar and play with it. We got to get you lessons. You got to do all this stuff. And I try to tell them like, look, you got to cultivate your interests. And you do that by playing and trying new things. And so I get a little worried about too much screen time. And and you were saying, I've got kids. And so it's like, I'm always trying to get them to be like, hey, like my daughter right now, you know, she's only eight. She doesn't just use one glue gun. She uses two glue guns at once, once with glitter glue, one without (laughs) top of things. So yeah, that's, that's, you know, I spend a lot of time with them and it's anything from, like I say, doing creative things like that or playing sports or whatever. I feel like your overall consciousness is to help humanity fix. And while you're working with a wonderful people to do that at home, to make sure things are being fixed, you fix them for yourself. And that's that's what I think we all do. Like, in order for me to <clears throat> get out to my lovely culture, I have to practice and I have to work and I have to be conscious of art. And I have to worry about, uh, I remember when 9-11 happened, <clears throat> we were on tour and we decided to stop because you could just feel the pain everywhere and you have to do your part and mm. you have to let everybody breathe and you have to know what is right and what is wrong. And, and, and it sounds like, uh, you know, you do a little bit, if, you're, if your children are building computers, I mean, I mean uh, but my kids are playing drums, you know, so it's cool, it's cool uh, that uh, we, get to, we get to have that and that we get to indulge in our personal lives with our children that take after us. Uh, I make whiskey and I was talking to, uh, the gentleman who makes my whiskey. And he was saying that, you know, he's from the oldest distillery in Iowa. It goes from grandpa to dad to him. And he's saying, hey, if the kids get interested in the distillery, fine. If they don't, fine. But, you know, he more or less was alluding to, you know, they'll probably be involved too. Um, And that's cool when it works out that way, you know? And uh, um, anyway, lots we can talk about, man. Fascinating. Um, I'm glad you put, you didn't necessarily put Middle Earth to rest, uh, but at least I could put, you know, these these holes that you fly into. Maybe I can put them on the side for a minute. I'm a little upset about Sasquatch and not giving up. I literally, do you know, I want to share one thing with you real quick. Literally a couple of years, eh, about four years ago, I had a team of people and I was going to solve the problem. Uh, and it was all going to be with trail cameras and linear walking for miles, miles you know, because Sasquatch, he migrates. The rogues migrate. They have to. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, we're just going to get in the line like they do when they look for missing children. And we're going to just walk. Right. And we're going we're gonna to figure this out. But uh, somewhere along the line, I was like, no. You know, I found my two feet in the ground and I went, no. No, I don't want to know. I don't want to disturb that. If, if that beautiful thing is alive and spent its whole existence avoiding us by hiding its bones, its poop, its hair, if it's done that, and all I have to say is you said that there are worm creatures un- underneath Antarctica that can't make shells, why can't there be a Sasquatch? So what I'm saying is somewhere along the line, I was like, the moral is I was like, we need to stay away. The people that shouldn't be by those worms need to stay away from those worms and let the people like yourself study those worms and make sure we do it the right way. And people like me who's fascinated with Sasquatch just for truth of understanding where my feet lie on the earth, I'm going to leave it alone because it's more beautiful that way. So anyway, it's, and that's why I wanted to talk to you, man, because I knew we would, uh, you know, it's just, we didn't even get to talk about the other planets and that, that's, uh, uh, we, but that's what the electric theater is about. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll reconvene together again. And maybe you can tell me what you've seen on other planets and what, what you think the future is, but there's a lot of good things that we can start with here today. Be safe. Thanks a lot for your time. Take care of you and yourself and, uh, keep up the great work, man. I'm very interested in a lot that you said. I'm a, try to educate myself on some of the things that you threw out there and 
and see if I can make a difference somehow in understanding. So uh, thanks and have a great weekend. Thanks. You too, Sean. Next time we can do Middle Earth and Natural Disasters. Uh, I, I love that. Natural Disasters. And please, when I'm up your way, um, my, the lovely people that work with me will make sure that you, you and your family or your friends, and if you don't want to, maybe someone that likes Slipknot, but please, please come to a show when that happens. Oh, I'd love to. You know, and all that. And then we can meet and talk and, and just, you know, let me show you my NASA uh, and uh, so to speak. And uh, anyway, natural disasters. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so have a good weekend. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Sean. You too. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye.